Let's turn together in God's word to John chapter 6. The gospel according to John chapter 6. We'll begin reading at verse 22. And we'll read through verse 69. John 6, verses 22 through 69. The day following, when the people which stood on the other side of the sea saw that there was none other boat there, save that one where into his disciples were entered, and that Jesus went not with his disciples into the boat, but that his disciples were gone away alone, (coughs) Howbeit there came other boats from Tiberias nigh unto the place where they did eat bread. After that the Lord had given thanks. When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, neither his disciples, they also took shipping and came to Capernaum seeking for Jesus. And when they had found him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi, when camest thou hither? Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, You seek me, not because you saw the miracles, but because you did eat of the loaves and were filled. Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. Then said they unto him, What shall we do, that we might work the works of God? Jesus answered and said unto him, This is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. They said therefore unto him, What sign showest thou then, that we may see and believe thee? What dost thou work? Our fathers did eat manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, But my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven, for the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. But I said unto you that ye also have seen me and believe not. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life. And I will raise him up at the last day. The Jews then murmured at him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he saith, I came down from heaven? Jesus therefore answered and said unto them, Murmur not among yourselves. No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me. Draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be all taught of God. Every man, therefore, that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. Not that any man hath seen the Father, save he which is of God. He hath seen the Father. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him, as the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father. So he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. 
This is that bread which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. These things said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Many, therefore, of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can hear it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Doth this offend you? What and if ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? It is the Spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. And he said, therefore, said I unto you, that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my Father. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will ye also go away? Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. To that point we read God's holy word. That passage and many others explains the means of grace as taught to us by the Heidelberg Catechism in Lord's Day 25. Lord's Day 25, page 14 in the back of your Psalter. Question and answer 65. Since then we are made partakers of Christ and all his benefits by faith only, whence doth this faith proceed? From the Holy Ghost, who works faith in our hearts by the preaching of the gospel and confirms it by the use of the sacraments. What are the sacraments? The sacraments are holy, visible signs and seals appointed of God for this end, that by the use thereof he may the more fully declare and seal to us the promise of the gospel, namely that he grants us freely the remission of sin and life eternal, for the sake of that one sacrifice of Christ accomplished on the cross. Are both word and sacraments then ordained and appointed for this end, that they may direct our faith to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross as the only ground of our salvation? Yes, indeed, for the Holy Ghost teaches us in the gospel and assures us by the sacraments that the whole of our salvation depends upon that one sacrifice of Christ which he offered for us on the cross. How many sacraments has Christ instituted in the New Covenant or Testament? Two, namely Holy Baptism and the Holy Supper. Beloved of God, anorexia is a terribly difficult disorder. If you know someone who struggles with that disorder, or if you have struggled with it yourself, you know how terribly difficult it is. And if you are in that situation, or you struggle with it yourself, or know someone who does, please get the help that you need. It's a difficult and frightening disorder because a person begins to starve themselves by their own hand. They think that they are too large and need to be leaner. Though everybody else can see that they are frightfully skinny and malnourished, they think they need less nourishment. And sadly, give themselves even less and make themselves leaner by their own hand. As terrible as that is, spiritual anorexia 
is even worse. Where one is starving spiritually, needs spiritual nourishment, and yet does not think so, thinks that they have enough and more than enough, and that really they could have leaner spiritual meals and end up starving themselves by their own hand, willingly seeking out a kind of spiritual meal that is even more jokes rather than exposition of the scriptures, more stories upon stories, and leaner and leaner meals, granting themselves by their own hand a famine of the word of God. What a terrible and difficult thing. And there is such in the world today, spiritually anorexic people. And there is a famine of the word of God in many places, thankfully, not everywhere. We're thankful for faithful believers throughout the world, but there is a famine of the word of God in many places and people who would love to have it so. Ligonier puts out its state of theology survey every couple of years. And it just came out for 2022. A survey of evangelicals in the United States, those who are members of Protestant, Bible-believing, evangelical churches. The results of that survey are quite astounding. 56% of evangelicals, these are, this is not Americans generally, this is evangelicals, say that God accepts all forms of worship from any religion, Christianity, Judaism, Islam, whatever it might be. 43%, almost half of those who call themselves evangelical Christians in this country believe that Jesus was just a, a good teacher, but that he is not God. so that you're left asking the question, what is being proclaimed in these pulpits? People are starving for the word of God. Are sermons merely story hour? And yet, sadly, so many say, I could use an even leaner meal. Even this is, is too much for me. It'd be better for me if I had less. May God's spirit fall upon such places in this land again and return people to a love of the word of God and a faithful, full, substantive exposition of that word of God for the preaching of the word of God faithfully, beloved, is vital. It's so vital that under normal circumstances, people don't go to heaven apart from the use of this means. That's the contention of the Heidelberg Catechism here in Lord's Day 25. That faithful proclamation of the Word of God is the chief means of grace. That is, the chief means that God uses to work faith in the hearts of people. The Holy Spirit, answer 65, says, works faith by the preaching of the gospel, which faith we need to be partakers of Christ and all of his benefits. The catechism has taught us back in Lord's Day 7 already that it wasn't enough that Jesus simply existed. It's not enough that Jesus simply is there, but a person has to be united to this Christ so that all the benefits of his saving work that are folded up in him, as it were, can become theirs by union to this Christ. They flow from him to them personally. And faith is the bond that unites them to this Jesus Christ. Faith is necessary to have these benefits. But where does faith come from? How am I going to have faith? How are my children going to have faith? That's answered here. Lord's Day 25. It's worked. It's wrought in the minds and hearts of God's people by the faithful preaching of the Word. 
and it's confirmed or strengthened by the use of the sacraments. Faithful preaching is not just a nice bonus. It is vital. But how do we know that the catechism is right about that? And how do we know what faithful preaching is? We could turn to many places in the New Testament to find answers to those questions, but this morning, let's turn to the preaching of the Lord Jesus himself here in John chapter 6 to find answers to those questions. And let's do that under the theme, the faithful preaching of the Son of God. The faithful preaching of the Son of God. Let's notice first a faithful sermon. Second, the chief means of grace. And third, the implications of this for us. It's very striking, beloved, to make the simple observation that when the Son of God came down to the earth, he became a preacher. He preached. He is God in human flesh, has sovereign power over all things. He could perform miracles and did. He brought the dead to life, healed the sick and the lame. As we saw last Sunday, he had control even over the wind and the waves. And yet when he sought the salvation of his people, he preached. That was the means that God himself in our flesh used to work faith in the hearts of his people. That ought to tell us something. We have recorded in the New Testament a number of his sermons. The most famous of those, of course, is the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 through 7, which really is an exposition of the Ten Commandments. We have the mention of his sermon to the true travelers on the road to Emmaus, where we read Luke 24, verse 27, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. A long sermon. We have record in Luke chapter 4 of him going to the synagogue in Nazareth on the Sabbath day and himself becoming the preacher for that synagogue worship on the Sabbath day and preaching a sermon from Isaiah chapter 61. And then we read there that this was his custom, that he went to church, to the synagogue. The synagogue was the church of that day, and their worship service looked almost exactly like this worship service. And Jesus preached, as was his custom, on the Sabbath day in the synagogue. In John 6, what we read this morning, is another example of him doing that same thing, preaching in the synagogue on the Sabbath day. Notice verse 59 of John chapter 6, the comment that comes at the end of his discourse. These things, all these things that we've read before verse 59, these things said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. He is preaching on the Sabbath day in the regular worship service of synagogue worship. Jesus was a preacher. He who, who could have saved his people by any means, or even without means, if he wanted to, chose the means of preaching. He could have gone around and, and just pointed at people and snapped his fingers and, and it would have saved them. He could have formed a Christian rock band while he was on the earth. Jesus and the Galileans and went around to the synagogues and performed or got a, 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 a drama troupe and went around and performed dramas in the synagogues. But he didn't. He preached. He went around preaching. And the apostles followed suit. So that as you watch them in the book of Acts, they go around preaching the scriptures. 
And they gather people into churches, and they set up elders, and then they put ministers, pastors in those churches, like Timothy and Ephesus and Titus and Crete. And then Paul writes letters to them and says things like, Timothy, preach the word in season and out of season. Rebuke, exhort, comfort, preach, Timothy. And the faithful church of Christ has done that ever since. How did Jesus preach? Let's examine his sermon here that he preached in the synagogue of Capernaum. It's going to be so much better now if you take out your Bible, if you don't have it out already, and turn to John 6 and follow with me. Let's point out six things from Jesus preaching that shows what faithful preaching is. There's other things you can say about preaching Faithful preaching, too, but six things come out here in the faithful preaching of Jesus. Number one, notice that Jesus' preaching is expository. That is, he has a text of Scripture. For him, it's the Old Testament. He has a text of Scripture, and he expounds that text to the people. His text here is a text that some of the people in the synagogue had a question about, which is not a bad idea for a preacher for taking his text either. But the text is from Scripture. It's given to us in verse 31 of John chapter 6. And many of the people, sorry, that's chapter 7, verse 31, our fathers did eat manna in the desert as it is written. As it is written is always a clue that you're going to have a quote from the Old Testament. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. That's Jesus' text right there. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. And in what follows, he expounds that text. In the next few verses, he expounds the words he gave from heaven. Who gave them bread from heaven to eat? He gave from heaven. Who is that? Who is it referring to? What are the words of the text mean? Verse 32, then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven. The text ultimately is not talking about Moses. He is not the man who gave from heaven. But my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. As he goes on, he expounds the word bread of the text. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Verses 33 through 35. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Verse 35. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. And then he expounds the word them. He gave them. Who's the them? Who? He gave them bread from heaven to eat, verses 35 through 40. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. He that believeth on me shall never thirst. But I said unto you that ye also have seen me, and believe not all that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. Who's the them? It's those who, who believe on me. And I can further explain that to you by saying it's those whom the Father has given to me. He's interrupted in verse 41 very rudely in the middle of his sermon, but then he continues expounding the word them in verses 43 through 46. Murmur not among yourselves. No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught of God. Every man, therefore, that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. Not that any man hath seen the Father, save he which is of God, he hath seen the Father. That's the them. And then finally, he explains the words to eat. In verses 47 through 51, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Verse 47, verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. 
I am the bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If a man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. Jesus teaches us that faithful preaching is expounding the words of Scripture. Not giving some vague general thoughts or, or feelings about what this text does for me, although that might be part of an application, but explaining what the words mean and how they relate and the significance of them. That's preaching. Number two, <coughs> notice that in Jesus' sermon, he lets the scriptures explain the scriptures and then he shows the people that he's letting the Bible explain the Bible. In verse 45, he brings in a verse from the prophets that helps explain the them of his text. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be all taught of God. This is explaining the them who eat are those who believe on him. And those who believe on him are given of the Father to him. He uses this Old Testament passage by saying, that those who eat are those who are taught of God himself. The scripture is the inspired word of God and is therefore its best interpreter. And the preaching of the word of God makes clear that the word is explaining itself. The word supports itself. The word expounds itself. These are God's words, not my ideas. God's words. Third, Notice that Jesus presents his exposition of the text in a logical way. Careful logic. For example, he explains his text, which is, he gave them bread from heaven to eat, by explaining them to them that this text has to be talking about a greater bread than the manna that came down from heaven in the Old Testament. Because it's bread from heaven. And that manna that your fathers ate back there didn't keep them alive forever. Bread from heaven will surely give people eternal life. It's heavenly bread giving eternal heavenly life. And it didn't do that for them. There must be another bread it's pointing forward. logical question comes up, well, why do some eat this bread and others not? And he gives the answer. He says, logically, this will point you to the doctrine of election. My father gives some to be able to eat and not others. It's a careful, logical explanation of his text. Fourth, notice that the Lord is not afraid to preach doctrine, theology in his sermon. In fact, he preaches quite some deep doctrines and truths. He preaches the doctrine of election here. He's not afraid to do so. He preaches some hard sayings, he says in verse 60. He preaches faith and its relationship to election. He preaches heaven. He preaches eternal life. And he shows how it all connects together. He preaches the preservation of the saints and shows how faith and preservation is all ultimately tied back to election and what brings to eternal life. Verses 39 and 40. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing. That's preservation of the saints. But should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life. Careful doctrine. There's no Arminianism here in Jesus' preaching. He preaches the doctrine of the Trinity. 
in his sermon, the Father is doing the choosing and the giving of these people over to him. In his sermon, he is the bread. And in his sermon, the Spirit, verse 63, is the one who's giving life. He's preaching doctrine. And he's connecting things together, the whole counsel of God. And he's preaching his text in the light of all the truths of God's word. Fifth, notice that his sermon is Christ-centered. He's explaining this text, an Old Testament type, as pointing to himself, fulfilled in himself. I am this bread. I am the true manna. He teaches that he stands at the heart of Scripture. And therefore, the word of God is ultimately pointing to him as the Catechism tells us in Lord's Day 25, preaching then is to point us to the one sacrifice of Christ as the only ground of our salvation. It is to be Christ-centered. Sixth. Notice that Jesus' sermon contains soul-stirring applications that flow naturally out of the truth and the text that he's been preaching drives the implications home to the people who are hearing in front of him. His exposition of his text culminates in a section where he confronts them now with the realities that he's been explaining to them. I am this bread. I am truly what the text was talking about. God sent me down to you. Now what in the world are you going to do with me? Eat, partake, that's what you do with bread. Partake of me, lay hold of me as your only hope. Verses 53 through 58. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day, for my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed, etc. He makes it personal. He brings it right into their laps, except you people eat and you people drink. He points out the way of life. He confronts them with the realities now that he's been explaining to them brings it right home to them so that they're faced with this. What am I going to do with this now? Am I going to embrace this or am I going to turn away from this? This is the preaching of the Lord Jesus. This preaching, according to this Jesus himself, is the chief means of grace. Verses 61 through 63. When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Doth this offend you? What and if ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? It is the Spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. And now this, the words that I speak unto you. They are spirit and they are life. The words that I proclaim to you are life for you. This is why he preached. It is his Father's will that he bring words to them and that the words that he expound to them from Scripture, explaining the passage of Scripture concerning himself and applying it to them, this would be what gives life to them. Not just the words on the page, but as he expounded them, explained them, preached them. It wasn't enough for the Ethiopian eunuch to have Isaiah 53 opened in front of him. God had to send Philip out for this one man, this one elect of God, that he might preach that word to him, explain it, and apply it to him as the means of grace 
to him, drawing faith out of him. Paul wanted so badly to go to Rome and to Spain to preach the word to those people. It wasn't enough for him to take some Bibles and put it on a crate and send it on a ship over to them, good as though that would have been. But they had to hear it explained, expounded to them, preaching, explaining that word. And calling gives life. It's the means, the main means of faith. Now faith... In its activity, laying hold of this Christ, trusting in him, resting in him, is produced by the Holy Spirit through this means of preaching where God has first already come and by the Spirit put the seed of new life in the hearts of people. Jesus himself says this. Verses 63 through 65 of John 6. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. Now, what explains that there are those who will believe not? Jesus says in verse 65, Therefore I said unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given to him of my Father. No man can believe, embrace what I am preaching to you, except it was beforehand already given to him of my Father. The ability to embrace it was given of my Father. You see, the preaching of God's Word does what water does for a seed. So you plant a seed into the ground, and that seed has all of the life of the plant and the fruit contained in it, in potential in that seed. And somehow, miraculously, this is by the Spirit too, by the way, the Spirit gives all life, including plant life. Thy Spirit, O Lord, makes life to ab abound Earth is renewed and fruitful to ground. And that water is put upon that seed and it calls out and draws that life that's in that seed out into activity. So too, the preaching of God's word, it's like that water, it comes out. And when it falls upon that seed that's been planted into the heart of God's people, it, it draws that life out of that seed into a life of faith of hope, of love, of service. I guess the catechism's correct. Since then we are made partakers of Christ and of all his benefits by faith only. Whence doth this faith proceed? Where does it come from? From the Holy Spirit who works faith in our hearts by the preaching of of the gospel, what a passage is John 6. where Jesus teaches us what preaching is, how to preach, teaches us what preaching does, the significance of it all in one passage. But now, maybe the objection comes, yes, but Jesus is talking about his own preaching there. The words, I speak, Jesus speak. They are spirit and they are life. And that makes complete sense. He's the son of God. If we hear Jesus' voice, if he preaches, I can understand that it could be this chief means of grace to draw faith out of that seed of new life. But he's not here anymore. He's gone away. He's in heaven. And now preaching just comes from a, a pitiful little man, a sinner at that, the words, I speak, Jesus said, they are spirit and they are life. But then we need to remember something else Jesus said about preaching in the previous chapter, John 5. 
John 5, verse 25, where he said, The hour is coming, and now is. The hour is, and it's also coming after me, after I'm gone, that the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. He said that we would be able to hear his voice in the preaching of the word, even after he's gone, and that the dead shall hear his voice and shall live. How Romans 10 puts it all together. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call upon him whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe him whom they have not heard? You know probably that the of is not supposed to be there. How shall they believe him whom they have not heard? Christ speaks yet. When the preaching is faithful to this, when it's not, it's not Christ's voice. It's not as though the minister somehow becomes Christ. It's because this is his voice. And when the exposition is faithful to this, Christ speaks and the dead live. His voice is heard. It calls life out of that sea. So that still, his word is spirit. His word is life. This is why it's still the chief means of grace, even after he's gone away. What about those in whom that seed of life is not planted? Well, then that preaching falls like when you water the ground, but there's no seed there. It doesn't draw any life out. Even if Jesus is the one speaking. Verse 66. And there were many who went back and walked no more with him. And he knew that they were going to do that even before he preached to them with his own voice. Verse 64. Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not. He still preaches to anybody who is there in front of him and he calls out to them personally, eat, eat of the flesh of the Son of God and live. And if you don't eat, you're dead. And we too must preach, issue forth this voice to any who preach that call externally. Here's who he is. Believe on him. But understand that the grace and the power and the intention to save by the Spirit is taken to only those who have that seed of new life within them and it draws that life out of them. The preaching itself is not the grace. It is the means of grace. The grace is the Spirit taking it internally to the hearts of those in whom that seed has been planted. And then it's a power to all to whom it's intended to be a power. And Jesus' preaching doesn't leave the impression of anything otherwise. He doesn't come out with a, a call and say, God loves you all and has a wonderful plan for your life. If only you'll accept him into your hearts. He's begging you, please. He can't do it. He can't go in unless, unless you do it first. But he says, here's who I am. Here's what the scriptures proclaim about me. God has sent me to you. I am the bread. Eat, partake. And if there's no life in you, he himself says, you won't come to me. If you do, you believe, you embrace. Here's ultimately the explanation of it. My father has given you to me. The implications of Jesus' preaching and his own understanding of the preaching are two. First, if the Lord views preaching as the chief means of grace, my words are spirit and they are life. 
then the sacraments that he himself institutes later must not be the chief means of grace. And when we look at him giving, instituting those sacraments, that becomes clear. When he institutes the Lord's Supper a little bit later, he never says anything about that supper that he says about the preaching. He doesn't say, and this bread and this wine are spirit and they are life. He says they are signs, they're symbols of what I was declaring to you back there in John 6, that my life is bread, my blood will feed you, my broken body will shed blood for you. It's signs and symbols of that. When he institutes baptism, Notice, he calls them first to preach. Go, therefore, and teach, preach to all nations, and then baptize. Preaching is the chief means, and the, the baptism will be a sign that confirms to them what you have preached to them. This is why the catechism says, the Holy Spirit works faith in our hearts by the preaching of the gospel and confirms it by the sacrament. Second, the implication of Jesus' own preaching and his own understanding of the preaching, beloved. Would it not lead us to have the highest possible view of faithful proclamations of his word? This is the means that he has provided to grow faith in our hearts and the hearts of our children and grandchildren and as many as the Lord our God shall call all over the world. Are we wiser than the Lord Jesus himself? This is what he has given. This is what he has called the chief means of grace. Surely then, we come to it saying, this is my food. This is how I eat. This is the sustaining of my spiritual life. This is what will draw my children to him and will keep them united to him and grow them. When this is going on in the church, I'm there, and I want my children to know I'm there because this is so utterly important. His words are spirit, and they are life. It means we pray for preachers who are but men and earthen vessels, that they bring this word and not their own words. It means we pray for the elders who must oversee the preaching of the word of God. And it means we come a certain way to that preaching, ready to listen, ready to receive, not the words of any man, but Christ's expositions of Christ's word to me. Feed me, pastor, feed me. I come waiting with bated breath, not to hear you, but to hear the voice of my Savior. What does God have to say to me now? I'm waiting upon it like Cornelius was waiting upon the words that Peter had to preach from God to them in Acts chapter 10. And Cornelius said, Behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Send to Joppa and call hither Simon, whose surname is Peter. And now Cornelius speaking to that Peter. Immediately, therefore, I sent unto thee, Peter, and thou hast done well that, they are, that thou art come. Now, therefore, are we all here present before God to hear all things that are commanded thee of God? Is that you? Is that how you come to the preaching of God's word? We're all gathered here, preacher but not before you. We're gathered here before God to hear what God would speak to us. You've studied that word. You must study that word. You've labored over it. To 
declare what he has to say to us. We're waiting. We're all sitting here waiting what God would speak. We don't care about your words. What would we care about your opinion about things? We don't. We want to hear the voice of God and Jesus Christ to us. Tell us what he would say. Even if it offends us sometimes, steps on our toes, shows us ways we need to change. That word that Jesus preached in John 6. Remember? He said in verse 61, doth this offend you? Sometimes it offends us. Sometimes it offends the preacher. And it must. Bring his word yet. Even then. For his words are spirit. And his words are life. Father, we give thanks for thy holy word. Give us not a famine of it, O God, and let us not take it for granted. Feed our souls, strengthen and nourish us, grow faith in us and our children after us, and as many as thou shalt call from all the world. In Jesus' name, amen.